can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have John Corcoran. You've probably heard him on my podcast several other times of Rise 25. But John, before I formally introduce you, I've never formally introduced you on my podcast before because we have other episodes, but this one is specifically about your story. Um, I always like to mention other guests people should check out Um, and some other ones people should check out. uh, Jason Swank, I did two episodes with him. One he built his agency to over eight figures and sold it. And then he um, had another one where he's been buying agencies. And that's a really interesting one. Our good friend, mutual friend, Ian Garlic, uh, videocasestory.com, um, talks about how his dad, he learns a lot, a lot of lessons from his dad. And his dad had a restaurant with live dolphins in it. And by the way, that restaurant was not in Orlando. It was in Wisconsin, So, which <laughs> makes it even stranger. Check that episode out, a lot of lessons. And uh, also, a D. Clevett, uh, mutual friend. This is one of my favorite episodes because we talk and geek out around productivity and software and what we use. And it's a great episode on tech tools, but how to be more productive. So check that one out. And a D. Clevett has a great podcast as well. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually do that by helping you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. And John, you know this, that we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company. Um, you know, For us, and this is how John and I first got connected, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way over the past decade than to profile the people and companies I most admire on this planet and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com or email us, support at rise25.com. I am uh, excited to introduce John Corcoran. He's a former Clinton White House writer, speech writer to the governor of California. He's worked in Hollywood for DreamWorks. He worked at the heart of Silicon Valley, ran his own boutique law firm in San Francisco Bay Area, catering to CEOs and entrepreneurs. He's written for Forbes, Entrepreneur, Business Insider, and I can list a dozen others. Um, But, you know, at one point, John, Inc. Magazine listed your podcast, Smart Business Revolution, as one of the top podcasts. And John has interviewed the founders and CEOs of Activision, LendingTree, OpenTable, Vern Harnish, Gary Vee, and many, many, many more. He's the co-founder of Rise25, where he helps B2B businesses connect to the Dream 100 clients or referral partners and actually get R- get ROI using a podcast. And most impressive, he does this, he has four kids. He's a father of four kids, he juggles work and family life. I don't know how he does it. I can hardly do it with two kids. John, thanks for joining me. I'm so excited to be here, thanks for having me. You know, when I do, you know, as you know, I always do a lot of research ahead of time. And um, one of my favorite stories from your background, we'll talk about lessons and lessons learned from some of your mentors um, one of my favorite stories from your journey is has to do with uh, country western DVDs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Digging deep into the archives there with that story. Okay. So set the stage. What what was going on at the time? Yeah. So um, I, as you mentioned, I worked in the Clinton White House, and um, back then, um, the way it worked was uh, when people when staff left the White House, they would uh, one of the honors you could so- sometimes get in on was to watch the president record the historic radio address, which when I was there at least had been done since um, you know FDR, and uh, it was recorded in the Oval Office, and like maybe a hundred staffers would be there and it'd be like celebrities and like members of Congress and governors and, and departing staff. And um, I found out maybe a couple of days beforehand that I could get in on this. It was like right, right around my last day of work. So I called my family and my dad and my brother were the only ones who were able to come in. So they flew in 
to come to this. And um, we go down to the Oval Office with 100 other people, as I said, like governors, members of Congress, stuff like that. But we knew beforehand that President Clinton at the time was building up his DVD collection. Now, this sounds really dated. If we're quoting this now, but at the time, he's building up his DVD collection. And he's a big country Western uh, fan of like Western movies. My dad was actually a film critic on television for many years. So like his encyclopedic knowledge of like movies. So we bought a bunch of DVDs and we put a little bow on it and we brought it down. We came down there and we get in this, you know, we get, get in the Oval Office. President comes in, sits down at the Resolute desk there, records the radio address. These days it would probably be for YouTube or something like that. Um, it records it and then and then starts like doing the like rope line, like like uh, you know, shaking hands and taking pictures with people and stuff like that. And he's like moving through all these people because he does it every Saturday, right? And um, and he's moving through all these people, and then we come up and we hand him the gift. And he looks down at it, and then he has like a five minute conversation with us. Like no one else they talk to, and everyone else is looking at me like, who are these guys? Why are they getting a long conversation with him? And um, it was really amazing because it, it made me realize the lesson that I take from that is that, you know, I talk to people all the time that really struggle to reach out to people that they admire, respect from afar. And they think that they're going to be like taking from them or, or inconveniencing them. But just like a sincere act of of gratitude. And I was just giving them a gift like here. I know you're building up your DVD collection. I appreciate working for you here at the White House. It's been an amazing experience. I just want to thank you for that. It led to this, you know, wonderful moment for us and this opportunity to just have a, you know, a conversation. It's my dad and and the president, the leader of the free world, having this conversation about their favorite movies. And if you can try and keep that in mind, if I can manage to have that in that context with a hundred other like leaders staring down my neck and in like this place of power, then you can certainly do it in your industry with the people that you respect and admire, the leaders in your industry. When you talk about networking, you're really talking about relationships and forming relationships and how can we help someone. And in that situation, you know, you did research ahead of time and found out their needs and their wants. Yeah. 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 I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't me giving uh, something that I cared about. It was something that he cared about. And that's why he was willing to have that in, in conversation. It was engaging, talking about Westerns. My brother and I, by the way, were there, like had nothing to contribute to that conversation. Fortunately, my dad was there to talk about Western movies because we didn't know anything they were talking about. You've always been pretty consistent with your messaging. I was actually watching an interview that you did five years ago uh, with Art of Manliness. I think it was over five years ago. And um, you were talking about at the time, 50 people, look at the top 50 people you want to connect with and see how you can add value to mm -hmm. them, yeah. right? One of the things you did at the time is you were writing for like Forbes and Entrepreneur and some of the other magazines. And um, one of the pieces you did was uh, the t 25 professional net networking experts to watch in 2015. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about some of the people. Like if we go back to 2015, which whatever year this is, someone's listening. Here's some of the people on that list and like talk about some of the people that you actually formed a relationship with back then. We have, yeah. so Michael Port's on the list, Judy Robinett's on the list, Jason Gaynard's on the list, Susan mm -hmm. Rowan's on the list, Keith Ferrazzi, Larry Benet, Jordan Harbinger, Michelle Lederman, uh, Adam Grant, Daniel Pink, Andrew Warner, Dory Clark, Michael Simmons, Derek Coburn, Stephanie Palmer, Noah Kagan, Ramit Sethi, Ryan Holiday, Svi Ban, James Swanwick, uh, Dr. Dave Stowiak, uh, Vanessa Van Edwards, Dr. Ivan Meisner, Tim Ferriss, and Mike Muni. So who sticks out? Who are some people that stick out to you when we're looking back in 2015 because of that article? Oh they man, used... so many of those. I mean, many of those, it's funny, some of them I didn't have a relationship with and some of which I did. So some I aspired to to get to know them and I actually did get to know them because of that article. Um, and then others, like I just knew they were valuable and I'd like to get to know them better. Um, and so many great things came from that. I mean, I ended up going to Jason Gaynard's conference and you and I became business partners because we both went to that conference. I don't remember where that, when that was published, if, if it was before the conference or what. Um, 
but many of those, I mean, Michael Port's been a you know friend for a bunch of years. Like many of those are people that to this day we keep in touch with, or we've done different forms of collaborations with. But it's funny because you say about consistency of messaging. The lesson from that came from actually Arnold Schwarzenegger, of all people. Um, so I, I mentioned my dad was a film critic, and he would also interview celebrities for the local TV stations that he well, worked for. Well, you were for. also out of a job because of Arnold Schwarzenegger. He, he comes back into my life another time. Yeah. But earlier, when he was still an action movie star, I remember my dad interviewed him a bunch of times for these movies that he came out with. And he was so disciplined and on message. That's what my dad would always say. Like, I interviewed Arnold Schwarzenegger today. And like any question you ask him, he would bring it back to that movie that he was talking about. You ask him about something else in his personal life, he'd bring it back to that movie. That, and that's partly why he was successful as a political leader later. But you're right. I was working for the governor that was replaced by Arnold Schwarzenegger years later and, yeah, lost my job because of him. So the you know, the on point is at that time you were writing articles and you realized something um, writing versus when you started podcasting. Yes. Yeah. The, the funny thing about that is that, I mean, I am a writer. I have got something I created when I was 10 years old from elementary school that, that said, what do we want to be when you grow up? And I, and I wrote, I want to be a writer because my dad was a writer. I had writers in my family. It was just something I was really interested in. I still really like writing. But I realized that writing was getting in the way because I was writing for Forbes or writing for Entrepreneur or stuff like that. And I realized that the real key thing you're doing with writing a lot of the time is you're building relationships. You know, at least that's why I was doing it many, in, in many cases. I would write these profiles and Ryan Holiday was one of them and, you know, and others. And, and I would write these profiles for like Forbes and stuff. And yeah, it would open the door, but it took so much effort and energy to create these these articles that it took it took forever. And so instead of like, what I realized is that instead of just doing like 10 of them a year, what I would be better off doing is having a conversation like for a podcast, and then I could do many more. You actually really helped me to realize that. And so when I shifted my energy from creating these long form profile articles that were custom written by me, and doing maybe eight or 10 of them in a year. And I shifted that to having a high caliber conversation with the right person and publishing it in the form of a podcast rather than an article. That's when I went to 40, 50, 60 conversations per year. I was building so many more relationships. It was just a vastly better use of my time. Yeah. And if you're watching the video part, um, the or if you listen to the audio there, I'm here. Here it is uh, the Forbes article, um, the 25 professional networking experts to watch in 2015. And it says, obviously, this is this is written quite a while ago. But and the funny thing, the funny thing about writing that is that you know it did take a lot of effort to put that article in, but it had such a big impact on many of the people. Like some of them, I remember had it in their email signature for many years, they'd they put that link into their email signature because it was so impactful for them. So you can imagine, the, you know, you know, their feelings towards you when you do that sort of thing, right? So you started podcasting a long time ago um, and you start, oh, tell the story um, at the time. So you, obviously we talked about your background at the White House, the governor of California, DreamWorks, um, but you were a lawyer at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I've always been interested in emerging technology, still am. You know, I love cutting edge new technology. And so, you know, podcasts were becoming popular around 07, 08. Um, and I was listening to a bunch of other podcasts and other people I knew were starting podcasts and I wanted to do it, but I didn't know, just like today in many ways, I didn't know where to start. I didn't know how to do it. So I started very simply. So I had a good client that had come to me for a tiny little matter. Actually, hired me to write a spare, write a lease on a spare bedroom in his house. These days, you just put it on Airbnb. Back then, there wasn't a platform like that. So hired me for 500 bucks to write this lease. And I researched a little bit about him. And it turns out he'd been a successful entrepreneur, started businesses that had gone public on the stock exchange. And I was like, this is a guy who I'd love to have as a great client. So I just kind of like on a whim said, hey, can I have like 20 minutes of your time? I'd love to interview you over video Skype at the time. I didn't know what I would do with it after we recorded it, but I said, I'd love to do this. And so he does it. And then, you know, hey, we have a great conversation. 
goes far beyond really like this limited engagement, lim- you know, the limited interaction that I'd had previous with him. And then at the end of it, he was like, hey, this was really a lot of fun. You know, I've actually got a couple other legal projects. I don't really know all the things that you do, but could you help me with these other legal projects that I have? And so he ends up hiring for these other things and becoming a great client. And it was just like light bulb moment went off. I was like, wow, this is great. I could do this all the time. I like having conversations with people. And so that's what really kind of sparked it for me. I was like, I'm going to keep on doing it. And I just, you know, kept on going and, and, and using it to, to first starting with, I was practicing lawyers. So started interviewing other lawyers in my local community, started interviewing other businesses in my local community and started radiating on for, out from there. And then realized I could interview anyone in any part of the globe, you know, and and it's been doing it ever since. The interesting part is, and we we talk about this a lot with the podcast, it can change and evolve with whatever your business evolves or whatever you evolve to, right? At that point, you were a practicing lawyer, Mm -hmm. right? Today, you call yourself a recovering lawyer. So it's obviously the podcast and the people you're, you're having on has evolved, but it's still smart business revolution. Um, so talk about you did it, you saw it working. And then what happened? <laughs> so I actually plotted this a while back, because I saw that I had a couple of years of increasing episodes published per year. But uh, and then it just kind of went off a cliff. I think I it is about uh, four or five years in, I think I had a year where I only published seven episodes and then a year when I published zero episodes. I was recording some episodes in that time, but I wasn't publishing them. And I just remember feeling like this angst and anxiety around it because I had not put a good system in place at all. I had a couple of people that were helping me with it, but I was totally the bottleneck at this point. I was thinking it need- I needed to have this really high standard of perfection. What I was applying, the standard of perfection that I was I was applying to the client work that I did with the legal clients, which is up here, and applying that to the podcast, which was completely unnecessary. Because I mean, I joke now that I never once have had a client come to me and say, you know, I was thinking about hiring you, but I went and looked at one of these episodes in your podcast archives and I saw a misplaced comma. And, you know, you really have a lack of attention to detail. And so I've concluded I'm not going to hire you. That has never once happened. But I was holding this really high standard. And so once I realized that it was a misplace of energies, and and once I, I shifted my energies to having as many high caliber conversations as possible, and then putting a system and a process in place and a team in place to handle the the production, the publishing, the show notes, the promotion, putting all that in place. Then I went from having a handful of conversations per year to having dozens, 40, 50, 60, sometimes 100 conversations per year with the right people. And you were frankly the one who helped me to figure that out. You helped me to figure out that I needed to have a system in place and a process in place. And, and I'm so grateful to that because it's, it was such a better use of my energies and I enjoyed it so much more. And, and it probably was less time consuming than putting out seven episodes where I was integral to, you know, writing the show notes and going and listening to the recording and all that convoluted stuff that I'd put in place previously. I want to hear what's the key. So other people don't give up. And and to, to that point, John, when you're talking about, you were applying the same level of standard and perfection to the legal work than you were to a podcast episode. I remember this hit home for me. I was watching a Joe Rogan episode at some point and in the middle of the, and it's probably arguably one of the most watched podcasts yeah. or listened to of all time. And in the middle of it, you know, they'll pull up screens and go, Hey, you know, can you pull this off? Let's take a look. And they go, Hey, pull this off. This person just, said this, pull it up. And the person searching, they can't find it. He's like, oh, forget it. We'll, we'll find it later. And they don't cut any of that out, right? It's just, yeah. you know, the medium of a podcast is an authentic conversation. I just remember thinking, wow, they just left all that in, which is fine. And you know, I didn't think anything of it, but as someone who sometimes people say, hey, can we cut this out? Can we do that? Thinking, well, this person who just 
there may be a hundred people listening to that episode uh, of someone's asking us, but the Joe Rogan one, there's millions of people listening to it. Yeah. And I think that's part of its appeal is the authenticity, you know, in a world where a lot of times things can seem like overly perfect and sanitized, you know, that a two person conversation in a podcast or a three or four person conversation in a podcast is an authentic you know, you're like a fly on the wall sort of thing. And I think that's what people are really drawn to. I remember listening to a Smartless episode um, a while back with Tina Fey was the guest on there. And in the middle of the episode, her daughter comes running in, who's like 14 years old. And it's like, mom, when are you going to be done with this? I want to go out. We're stuck inside. We've been here all day. It's taking forever. She's like, come on, I'll finish off. You know, and they kept that whole thing in there, you know? And, but I thought, well, that's really cool. You know, Tina Fey is someone I've been watching for many years, been a fan of, and I, I get to kind of see this other side of them. So relatable. So how do you, what's the key? So someone listening does not give up. Well, because so, I mean, you, it's not like you almost gave up, but, but like you weren't putting I almost out did. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was, I think I was on the verge of, of giving up. Um, I think not going it alone is a big part of it. So having, um, you know, having others who are supporting you in it, um, and, and, um, you know, focusing on the highest best use of your time. You know, there are people that they end up resenting parts of the process because there's so many different pieces to doing a podcast from preparing to having the actual conversation to the post-production to all that kind of stuff. And you're probably going to naturally not like one of those pieces. And you have to make sure to take that off your plate or you're not going to do it for the long term. You'll do it for six months. And then, you know, if you're not honest with yourself, you're going to stop doing it. I just, I was just looking up at one of my past guests the other day uh, who had started a podcast when I interviewed him like a year ago. And I just looked it up and I realized he hasn't published anything in a year or so, you know, and it's, and he was all excited about it at the time. And that happens all the time. And it happens because People, they don't like one piece of the process and they grow to resent it and they just don't want to do it anymore and they don't see the value of doing it. So if you come to appreciate the fact that it's having a high caliber conversation with amazing clients, p p referral partners, strategic partners, centers of influence in your industry, and you enjoy those conversations, you will keep on doing it. But if you if you do all this other stuff and that drags you down, you will not enjoy it. But even if you do enjoy it. So there are some people that we've known that, you know, they like as a hobby to do some piece of it. Maybe it's audio editing, video editing, maybe it's creating artwork. So they put their energy into the podcast artwork. Again, if you're putting all your energy and your resources into that, then that's going to take time away from the other pieces. And at some point, you're going to look back on it and you're going to say, you know what? I haven't gotten great results from this and I'm going to stop doing it or I'm going to put it on pause or I'm going to put it in a hiatus or whatever. And it might be because you've you know, spent three hours every Sunday morning editing the video when you should not have been doing that because that's not the highest and best use of your time. You know, Or yeah, you like doing research on guests, but you spent <laughs> seven hours um, doing all this research on the guests and when you could have had in that amount of time, seven other conversations with, you know, seven other people. And one of those might end up being an amazing client for you or an amazing referral partner. So it's it's about focusing on the highest and best use of your time, but also stripping out anything that that drains your energy so you can focus on the pieces that you really enjoy. I want to talk about letting go because you just mentioned that it may be, you know, for me, I'm wondering how you let go because you're a writer. You even wrote that when you were in grade school. I want to be a writer. And now with your podcast, you don't do any of the writing, right? Yeah. And so there was probably a transition to you actually, you know, relinquishing that control and the writing. Now, I, as a biochemistry major background in science, I hate writing. So like the thought yeah. of me writing, I was great like have someone else do it but you're a little different so mm -hmm. for someone like you said who's like i like doing this part mm -hmm. how did you eventually relinquish control over the writing piece um slowly um you, you know you have to um you have to trust that others going to do it and it may not be a hundred percent standard of perfection that you want it to be um but it's going to be close enough that um 
that you're happy with it. And and again, reminding yourself too, as I said earlier, that I've never once had someone contact me and be like, I'm not going to hire you because I saw this flaw in, in the the you know piece that you you put out. And they're not judging the work that you do and the podcast that you put out and the, by the same standard, right? If they're going to hire you for some other thing that you do. So you don't have to worry about those two things. Um, but also, again, you know, getting back to just trusting someone else who's going to handle, who's going to do the work for you. Um, and in the case, you know, someone like you who doesn't like writing, there are plenty of people like that who don't like writing, don't like editing. And you're maybe you'll find someone who's going to do it, you know, really, frankly, better than you, than you would. Um, we've seen this many times before where we've seen podcasters who do their own show notes or do their own editing or something like that. And yeah, they can get it done, but you look at the show notes, the show notes are like 25 words and, you know, it's typos and run on sentences and stuff like that. Or yeah, they edit it. Mine is embarrassing to look back on some of them. Yeah. Yeah. That I had to write early on before I had a process and a team. I was, you know, it was, it was midnight the night before and I didn't want to miss a, a week. You could probably relate to it. Mm-hmm. And it just, when you go back, it just was terrible. Yeah, yeah. And I had also a very convoluted process. So one of the things that you helped me with was I had this idea because I'd listened to other podcasts that had like a different custom intro at the beginning of every episode where they would preview everything else and talk about what they were going to talk about in that episode. So I had this idea that I needed to do that. So I I wanted to always record those after each episode, but after each episode, I would always get busy. So I would record the episode. I'd go right up until the very end. I'd run out of time to even have a post-interview collaboration conversation, which is the most critical component. And so then we'd run out of time. We'd both have to hop off and I'd have to hop on my next, my next call or whatever. And I'd forget about it. Weeks would go by. And then I hadn't recorded it. And then I have to go and re-listen to the episode, which made it even more time consuming so that I could record this little preview thing under the presumption that I had, I had no hard proof on this, that it was better in some way that the podcast would be better with this little preview thing on the beginning, you know? So that was one of the things that you helped me with. You're like, why are you doing this? This is, it's creating these convolution. And I think I'd even say the podcast episode number too. So then there was that piece too, you know, and if you move things around, then you have to re-record it. It was just a total mess. And I didn't realize that this, it was a mess. And I didn't realize that there was a better way of doing it until you helped me to revamp all that. I got rid of that and I made it made a much more streamlined process. Yeah. I mean, it's basically about, and I think this applies to business as well, but, um, you know, removing friction points, right? And, and the thing is, the only reason I could tell you that give you that advice is because I made the exact same mistake (laughs) and I just did it earlier than you, (laughs) but I did the same exact thing. So like usually when we're giving someone tips or whatever, it's basically because we have already made that mistake before Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and pretty much all, you know, many of the mistakes I want to talk about um, just some lessons learned, you know, some pivotal points, Um, and, you know, um, Antonio, uh, was, yeah, yeah, Santino was a person that you learned uh, a lesson from that prompted you, prompted you and kind of pushed you forward. Yeah. So uh, a couple of lessons for Antonio, great guy, real men, real style. Um, he's built an empire, um, YouTube channel and website and all that kind of stuff. And he and I were in a little kind of mastermind community early on. And I remember he, I was kind of writing about a lot of different things, a lot of different business advice. And he just kind of gave me the feedback. He was like, John, you're really good at like this kind of like networking thing, like how to build relationships with people strategically to grow your business and and get clients and stuff like that. He's like, you should really focus in on that. Um, And I think he also... um, taught me to embrace my background. Um, I'd gotten some bad advice from some some people that said, uh, one person in particular who said that, you know, you worked for a democratic president and you want to help business people and business people don't like Democrats. So you should never talk about the fact that you worked at the White House in the Clinton years. And um, that was really bad advice um, because I've talked to many Republicans 
Um, I've interviewed many Republicans on my show who were just interested in the, that background. You know, I've even interviewed people that work for Republican White Houses, and and we had so much in common. It was really interesting. So Antonio really like said like you should embrace that background, and you should you weave a new story basically where you help others to build great relationships in business, um, aka networking. But no one likes that word, so we don't often use that word. And in many ways, you know, what we're doing using the tool of podcasting is a is a modern reflection of that. It's helping people to build better relationships in business using the tool of a podcast. And so it was really critical feedback. Antonio was a guest on my podcast and, you know, was a friend and all that kind of stuff. And we were in the mastermind community together. And it really helped me to really zero in on what I should be focusing on with my business. You know, I joke around, and, and if I want to hear um, a lesson uh, you learned from uh, Bill Clinton, uh, actually, but um, my the way I describe John a lot of times is uh, when we're, we're, you know, I'll give him the the accolades he deserves, but then I'll say he also likes to screenshot himself in with presidents because uh, <laughs> now these are not Photoshop, but arguably. You know, if you're watching the video, there's uh, he's got him with Obama here, Clinton. He's here with Elon Musk. There's another one with you and um, Joe Biden uh, that's not on here. Um, but the the Obama one definitely looks like it was two distinct backgrounds there. But you, yeah, I, I, I trust standing you in, that we were standing in front of a door. But okay. yeah, because of that, there's all kinds of um, Zapruder film types of conspiracy theories well, about the authenticity of that picture. So we'll talk about what set the scene for this when you're you're with Obama here. Um, well, so that was an interesting one because it was actually a, probably the nadir of his um, presidential campaign. It was in oh oh seven, I think. Um, before he was president, he was senator at the time. He's running for president. At the time, Hillary Clinton was on the ascent, was the everyone thought she would be the nominee. And um, he just had this quiet confidence to him. Um, the group that it was, it was at an event that I was helping with, helping to organize and everything. Um, and there was a lot of people there that were just big fans of his, and he just had this real quiet confidence to him. Um, and I've been around a lot of presidents and presidential candidates and presidential campaigns. And they all have a different tone to them depending on the, the leader. And I'd never seen one quite like his. Most of them, it's it, there's a bunch of young people that are all anxious, that are super uptight and worried about getting in trouble or doing something wrong. And his team didn't have that at all. And it definitely came from the top down. They call it, you know, his nickname was No Drama Obama. And it was really true. And in fact, the reason I got that picture was because he was on the way out the door. I'd helped with this event. He actually just stepped in the restroom. He had to use the restroom before they got in the car and drove to somewhere else. And I said to one of their staff people, I was like, is there if I just grab a photo with him real quick? Now, in other presidential campaigns that, would, campaigns, that would be like verboten. Like you could never do that. Or they'd be like, absolutely not. No, you can't do it. And they're like, yeah, sure. What the hell? And he like steps out and I said, you know, uh, I Senator. thought you were going to say you interrupted him at the urinal and you're like, pose. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did take a leak next to Tiger Woods once. That's a different story. But um, so anyways, uh, so it, it, I don't have a picture from that. But um, the, but with, with the so I ended up taking the picture with him. And yeah, it was just, you know, it was just a quick casual moment with him. Um, but it's it's it definitely a reflection of the leader, uh, you know, how the, the tone that they set. What so lesson from. Bill Clinton. Is this is this uh the picture right here that we're looking at? Um yeah, it's right my shoulder after too. he um you gave him the DVDs or before? Um uh, or yes, it is. That is from the same story. Yeah. Um I've got the full version here with uh, my dad and my brother in it, if you want to see here. And we actually got it uh signed autograph later. So that's that one. Um less well, one of the lessons from him is um yeah, I read this, I think it was in George Stephanopoulos's um, autobiography about working for Clinton is that he never once in all the years of going around with him on rope lines in small beat and greets with different people never once heard him. And you, you meet some, you know, what's the word? Strange people like in those types of circumstances, people come up and say strange things to you. 
He never once did that and then turned around and quietly said to a staffer or something like that, what about that weirdo or anything like that? Never did that at all. Um, that doesn't mean that he, you know, the man didn't have his flaws. He certainly had his flaws for sure. Um, but he just had an incredible, genuine way about him um, and, and a charisma like you've never seen before. I, I was around people that had never met him before, not a fan of his at all come down to a, a speech of his to hear him speak or something, or maybe he ended up you know, shaking his hand on a rope line and just walked away like in awe over him. Um, he had an ability to talk to people and make you feel like no one else in the world was there. It was just the two of you having that conversation. Um, even if there are hundreds of people around, like he just zeroed in on people and just had, you know, an amazing impact. Um, and there were times, you know, I, I think that looking back on it, there's reasons why he was elected president. And this may be a controversial opinion. There's lots of reasons why anyone's elected president or not, but there's reasons why he was elected president. And even though he came from a poor upbringing in the poorest state in the nation, you know, father died when he was young, you know, because he really, really put emphasis and energy into into building relationships with anyone and everyone. He wanted to meet absolutely everyone. He, I was at events with him where he would give a speech, hour long speech, talk forever. Everyone's like tired of him talking. He's kind of famous for that. And then afterwards go and work a rope line for another hour afterwards. And he would go down shaking every single, every single hand going down for an hour, the entire thing, making sure everyone got their, their hand shaked. I've never seen someone like that have that kind of energy for meeting every single person. There were events that I was at where I was like, you know, like shake his hand on the on the rope line, and then I'd get back so that other people would have the opportunity to shake his hand, and I'd observe from from behind. And then it was, you know, it was like forty five minutes later, and he's still shaking hands. And it's like the president of the United States is still here shaking hands. Should I leave? Like I can't leave. The president of the United States is right there. Like I should probably stay. Should I go shake his hand again? He's working his way back down the rope line. That's how much he would energy he, he would he would spend to have a moment with as many people. These people came out to see him in many cases, like drove 12 hours or flew or stood in the in, in line in the sun for hours and hours waiting to get in to go through security to meet him. He would want to give them some time. This is why he was like always late for things, because he would spend so much time you know, going through and shaking hands with as many people as possible. I love that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. The um, the other person, uh, a lot of lessons. I'm not sure which one sticks out. Um, was from your dad. Um, you know, you've seen, you saw him, like you said, in the film industry, and obviously he probably imparted a, a bunch of advice to you throughout your career changes. Um, what's uh, some lessons that stick out from your dad. Oh man. Um, so my dad, you know, my dad was the son, of he was an air force brat. Um, his father was, um, in the air force. He was a, uh, B-17 pilot in World War II. He did 35 missions over Germany. We've got the certificate that has all the cities that he bombed. He was the captain of the B-17. About half of the B-17s, um, crashed, due to accidents or to maintenance issues, things like that, uh, not even were shot down by enemy fire. So very, very slim odds to even come back from that war. And uh, my and my grandfather was a very stoic man. And, and my dad is the opposite. He's uh, My dad was a stand-up comic for a bunch of years. Um, and he was a kind of a he did film reviews on television, um, great sense of humor. So I definitely got- Is this your dad's- this is your dad's dad here? That's my dad's dad there. Oh, yeah, on the left. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, and uh, you know, my my dad, uh, whereas my grandfather was like this same industry for his entire career, worked for the military his entire career, and then went back as civilian and worked in the Pentagon afterwards. St you know, like he would like invest in war bonds that like you put in a put in a hundred dollars and after five years you have a hundred dollars and $102, right? You know, he didn't invest in the stock market or anything like that. And uh, my dad was kind of went the opposite direction was it pursued passions and stand up comedy and um, not really like a stable career ended up working in, you know, news for most of his career, 
um, actually lost his job three separate times. And each time we ended up moving like across the country to a new place. Um, and so that was hard in retrospect, I'm glad for it because it forced me to meet new people and to learn, you know, to, um, be able to, um, work into, a, a new community, new school and stuff like that. Um, but he really prioritized family and like he prides himself that he did not miss hardly any in, in all those years of travel and having to fly to New York from Los Angeles to go to these movie junkets and interview celebrities and stuff like that. He didn't miss hardly a single sports game of mine or my brothers. He prioritized that he would make sure he wouldn't miss a soccer game. He missed like one. And there's a celebrity. There's a story behind it, which I won't tell. Um, it's his t- st- story to tell, but a famous celebrity from like the 80s and 90s who you've heard of before goes by one name. Um, caused him to miss a game for my brother where my brother had like a really good game. And to this day, he still complains about it. He still complains about this person because he's so angry about it. So I'm I'm the same with my kids. Like, it, and I teach my kids the same way. Like we go to sporting events. We don't miss them. I'm not going to miss them. We're going to be there to support you. And I teach it to my kids also. So that's like kind of a real big lesson for us. Do you remember him? Like, who are some of the favorite people he was able to to meet that he that he talked about? You name it, every star from the you know eighties, nineties. He stopped doing it in the late nineties. So, but I mean, you know, Julia Roberts, Tom Hanks, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Robin Williams. I met Robin Williams. Um, you know, all, all of those for sure. Um, yeah, it was, it's he funny. was proud that he was he. Uh, Steven Spielberg was his favorite director and uh, was a huge fan of E.T. in every movie that he directed. And um, he bumped into Steven Spielberg once and Steven Spielberg said, you are the only critic that I watch to him. Wow. And, Holy and yeah, that was like that was like his pride and joy hearing that. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about adapting. Um, because. Sometimes people hear your story on the surface and they're like, oh, he had a silver spoon. He made it to the White House, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is you really had to bounce around and adapt um, because your dad had a dynamic career where it forced him to move different places. Um, Talk about adapting. How did you go into those situations and make friends or fit in, right? Yeah. Um, It could be like someone listening to this doesn't matter how old you are, you're going to a new situation and have to fit in or um, kind of go into whether it's a conference or maybe it's a new school or wherever the, someone listening is. How do you go yeah. in and what's the approach you take? Yeah, I mean, it was hard. Um, you know, my my dad would go from being the one that everyone knew that I was the kid in class whose dad was on TV every night to because he was no longer on TV every night. Everyone knew that that kid's dad just lost his job, right? Which doesn't happen with everyone else because it's more anonymous. Um, so that was hard. And then you know, because there was only really three jobs in any one city, like being a film critic, you know, movie reviewer for the three stations in, in town, it meant that we had to move each time. And it meant that it sometimes took a while to get a new job in a new city. And so there were times when my dad was out of work for six months, eight months, you know, and we would go from, you know, living a comfortable life to slashing expenses, can't spend money on anything, Um, you know, really had to conserve things because it wasn't like he could just like pick up and do contract legal work or contract accounting work or something like that, you know. Um, So it was a bit of a high wire act and, and that was a little bit hard. And then we would move across country away from family and friends and all that kind of stuff. You know, I I think what I learned was just um, you can't get you 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 can't get too set in in one of of life being always the way that it that it is forever. Things could change in in a heartbeat. I was reminded of that this weekend. We were driving on the freeway, and something I I didn't even see what it was. Something like piece of metal or something smacked into our windshield at about sixty five miles an hour. And thank God the windshield didn't break apart but it it obliterated our um windshield wiper and cracked the entire windshield my entire family was in the in the uh you know car of course and uh you know so you you in life things can change in in a heartbeat and i remember my dad coming home multiple times and being like 
lost my job. Uh, you know, cause a new news director came in with clean house and fire half the people and put in new people in place, you know, because it's like painting a building. If you want to paint, if you want to change the appearance of a newscast, you re replace the people, you know, and you put new people in place. And so, you know, we'd be a casualty of that. And so, you know, when I came to a new place, it was about, you know, see, see how you can work your way in. And, you know, it was hard. I was talking this weekend with some friends about it. You know, I went from like, you know, living in Southern California, where it's like, you know, people go surfing and stuff and surfer culture to moving to like suburban Massachusetts, you know, um, which is completely different. It probably is culturally different as you can get um, while staying within the United States. Um, and, you know, you find who you can make friends with and just trying to work your way in. Or when I moved to Southern California later, um, yeah, I ended up joining the football team and sticking with it because I made friends there. And that was my group of friends when I when I got to high school. Um, so I had some people to to hang out with and not be or be by yourself. So um, I, I think the lessons are just to, to be flexible and to not be too stuck in your ways of things will always be this way forever because things do change and you have to adapt. Um, I want to talk about business mentors. And this could be distant mentors, like mm -hmm. books, mm -hmm. um, or just people who have you look upon for, you know, business related advice and help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who sticks out to you uh, in that realm? I mean, so many, uh, um, you know, we talked earlier about Antonio Santino and, you know, interviewing him for my podcast and getting advice from him was instrumental. Uh, Kevin Thompson was another one. I interviewed him for my podcast and he, um, w you know, had talked about how he built his business um, really through like strategic partnerships and gave me the idea to, to kind of follow what he had done, but in my own way. Um, and it, it really helped me get out of practicing law and helped me to build my blog and my podcast and um, build a business that wasn't totally dependent on me being the breadwinner at all times, like the legal practice was. Um, you know, and now being part of Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, uh, joining the Accelerator Program there, um, Dave Richmond, Corey Levenberg, um, there's so many people there that have been so helpful to me um, and just just getting a tidbit, getting advice, whether it's like at an event with someone and finding what they're focused on and filing away some challenge that they are focused on, how they've overcome it so that when you face it later, you kind of have that kernel in your in your brain. You can kind of remember back to, oh yeah, this person had that challenge. I can maybe go talk to them about it. Um, all of those have been, you know, Jason Swank, who you mentioned earlier, has been super valuable for us, been a great, and he was someone who um, I interviewed in my podcast. And I remember at the end of the conversation with him, you know, he, he was like, you know, wow, we've got a lot in common here. We, and we talked about a bunch of different ways we could collaborate through um, doing a presentation to one of his groups. And, um, you know, I think he invited me to be on his podcast at that point, And I did it. And we've like, after that one conversation, we've done all of those and more. Now you're a mentor in his community. Um, I'm going to his event in about a month. So he's been a great friend and a great mentor. Um, yeah, that, uh, that those are a couple that come to mind. I want to also, <clears throat> I know it's hard to pick your favorite child. I guess it depends on the day, but um, some of the your top favorite memorable podcast episodes. Um, who sticks out? as far as when you think back over the past, you know, over a decade of some of the people you've had on um, and in maybe something, a story that you remember from uh, that show. Oh man. Um, I mean, there's so many of them. Um, Adam Grant is one that I've referred back to a lot of times before because he wrote the book, give and take. I felt like his book, in many ways, validated a lot of the um, stuff, a lot of the advice that I've given people um, over the years, um, because he really he, he really had the social science proof behind um, the presumption that 
you know, if you are a good person and you're nice to people and you're kind to people that you're more likely to be successful. That was something that I just kind of tried to live by as a premise, but I never really had any, uh, you know, proof, so to speak, that that was, uh, in fact, something that was, um, you know, more likely to be true than not. Um, and it was something that, uh, you know, that, that he had done the actual social, social science resource behind research behind, um, you know, demonstrating that it was true. Um, let's see who else. What's interesting I, about uh, Adam Grant also is that, you know, in his book, everyone should check it out, you know, give and take, he has a couple books, but, um, he talks about givers, takers, and matchers. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting is the least successful and the most successful were givers, mm. right? So mm -hmm. just because you are giving does not mean you're doing it in the best fashion that will end up benefiting you and actually could end up hurting you in the, in the long run. Yeah, I mean, and, um, you know, one of the stories that he gave was uh, about Ken Lay, who is the CEO of Enron, which is another company. Uh, company that kind of inter intersects with my story as well, because Enron in the California energy crisis was um, part of the reason that I ended up losing my job and Arnold Schwarzenegger ended up getting elected as, as governor. Um, in give and take, he used it as an example as, as someone who seemed like they were a giver, but in fact was much more of a taker. And, you know, it turns out that Ken Lay was defrauding people that they were actually ripping off California um, and he ended up going to jail and, and I believe died in jail. Um, but I mean, there's, I mean, there's so many others. I mean, I've interviewed the, you know, I think you mentioned earlier from, you know, the co-founder of Netflix, Activation Blizzard, Quicken, Redfin, you name it, Kinko's. Um, Kinko's was a good one. You know, Paul Orofla, uh, the founder of Kinko's, um, actually founded that company in Santa Barbara and Isla Vista. Isla Vista is the little town next to UC Santa Barbara, which is where I went to school. And it was still a copy shop, like a photocopy shop when I went to college there. And of course, at the time, Kinko's at the time was a big nationwide brand. It since has been cold, sold to FedEx. It's now called FedEx Office, but it was a big nationwide brand. And I always had admired him from afar and wanted to interview him. And I made a goal of it. And I interviewed a bunch of people in the entrepreneurial community from Santa Barbara until I finally met someone who could get me an in and, and ended up introducing me to him and uh, so that he could, so that I could interview him. And so that was really cool. And the, I remember at the end of the conversation, um, I, I asked this question that always about ask people about, you know, who do they respect and admire? And he used that as an example, uh, Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia. And um, he get, when he gave that answer, I said, Oh, you know, I think I was after the recording. I said, Oh, Yvonne Chouinard, he's, He's just down the road from you in, in in Ventura, right? Do you know him? And he said, well, we met like once before, but we don't really know each other. And I was like, and I, I said, oh, actually, I really wanted to interview him at some point. And then that turned into him brainstorming with me how he could introduce me to Yaman Chenard. And he started saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. So after this interview is live, you let me know. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a handwritten note to him because I have his address and I'll send it and I'll recommend you and I'll tell him to go check out the episode. That way he'll know kind of what it's like. And I'm just like pinching myself. Here I am like interviewing, you know, this guy who founded a $2 billion company who's offering to stra strategizing with me how he can introduce me to this other world famous, you know, iconic entrepreneur, you know, and that's why I do this. That's why you do this, right? Because those sorts of opportunities come out of here and I can't imagine any other means in which uh, such amazing opportunities would would come to us. Uh, John, I want to be the first one to thank you. There was a lot of pressure on this because I haven't <laughs> had you on. And someone <laughs> exactly. who I, I know for so long. Um, so thank you. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Um, I always get to My experience pleasure. them firsthand 20 times a day, but it's a little different on the podcast. So everyone can check out Rise25. Dot com check out smartbusinessrevolution.com check out more episodes of the podcast and we'll see you next time thank you thanks john what i got you can't buy it resides between my eyes walked through the fire came out better on the other side see lights like a beach if you find the sailing right now i'm feeling like
like a hundred grand 